Okay, uh, thanks. Um, so we have this um, uh, exact ideal MHD solutions, which is called all right, uh, my name is Andrei Berezniak. This my name is here. You can also look up the name in the workshop program. So and then you know go to GitHub, uh, and in on the GitHub there is also references to papers. Um, so we have um, this uh, ideal MHD solutions. This is cylind in cylindrical geometry. Uh, they have a shark. And uh, basically, they can have all components of B, uh, rotation, etc. cetera, um, five parametric family. And uh, uh, you can use them to mess with your code and, and try to break it. Uh, sometimes you can break it. Uh, the, some, of the, some of those solutions are very hard to solve on Cartesian grid. Um, so um, if, you, if you're studying MRI, uh, good news for you because uh, mostly, you know, most people study MRI in uh, stationary solutions such as Keplerian flow or Taylor Quet flow. Now you have a non-stationary solution which is unstable to MRI, and this is an example of development of MRI. You see post-shock, uh, there is large perturbations are growing. Um, another question is what what are we trying to do in in numerics in general? Um, so we. I, I was just trying to obtain vinyl realization of turbulence in, 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 in the box or something else. Uh, you, can, you can apply the small perturbations to the solution and you can see how it changes the solution. Uh, so the red is, is analytic solution and blue uh, and green is a perturbed solution. And you can, you can see that there is this fairly robust features independent on perturbations, such as you know, anomalous heating, uh, or near the center due to rotation and there's rotation of magnetic field, etc. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Achun, please come on over. Uh, the one after is Greg. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Trung Hoa. I am a fourth year PhD student at the University of North Texas working with uh, Yuan Li and uh, I'm trying to advertise my poster to you today. So um, from observation we know that there is uh, multi-phase gas at the uh, accretion flows from the uh, in, in at the center of uh, elliptical galaxies and um, in these uh, quiescent systems, such as M87, the uh, get, sorry, uh, the um, the jet, um, the uh, AGN jet from uh, the center of the supermassive black holes, is uh, the most important source of heating in the galaxies. So. Um, the, there is great interest in uh, studying this uh, accretion flows um, uh, at the, the center of galaxies. So um, in this case, we're trying to study the accretion flows uh, from the galaxy scale down to the mesoscale scale of, um, of the galaxies. And uh, the way we're achieving this is that we're using a uh, simulation in Athena++ and uh, we have a, a bipolar jet which uh, drives turbulence mixing in the galaxy uh, scale simulation which creates uh, coal gas which is then cascade down into uh, within the uh, Bondi radius which is uh, similar to what we can see in the uh, observation. So um, this is the, for example, the mesoscale simulation uh, achieved by zooming into the center of the galaxy. Uh, this is uh, within 10 parsecs of the galaxy's uh, center. So if you're interested in the methodology and uh, the, our preliminary results, uh, please come to my posters. Um, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Greg House from the University of Iowa. I am. Uh, I have a poster here 
for, let me see which one, there we go. Um, it's called the Fundamental Parameters of Astrophysical Plasma Term and its, and its Dissipation in the Non-Relativistic Limit. If you're having a problem sleeping, uh, you can get it on archive. I just finished it Monday night at midnight and posted it. It's out now. It's about 70 pages long, so no matter how bad your insomnia is, it will be a solution. Um, the point about this is that this, this plot here shows that um, everything here on this side is in the fluid regime where it's, where it's collisional. Okay, so the mean free path is equal to your, to your fluctuation scale right at that, that boundary there. And for almost all space and astrophysical plasmas, even if they're driven in the, the fluid regime, uh, this is where the driving scale is, and you should go to the right to the box, this is where the dissipation scale is, or actually not dissipation, this is where the, uh, the uh, end of the uh, Larmor radius scale is, they all end up down here. So all of the dissipation in almost all of these systems is actually weakly collisional. So you need kinetic theory to describe them. And what that means is that, uh, you know, viscosity and resistivity are only valid up here. They break down as you get close to that boundary between the uh, yellow and the blue. Okay, so the mechanisms that actually dissipate the turbulence in almost all of our simulations are not viscosity or resistivity. So a big question, and I'll be leading a discussion in this on tomorrow afternoon in the evening um, about what are the right ways to connect our fluid models with our kinetic models and try to understand how to better patch up those fluid models to have better fidelity to the real underlying physics. And um, what this paper really comes together is I analyze all of the proposed um, kinetic damping mechanisms for collisionless turbulence and plot them on a scale. This is what I call a phase diagram for plasma turbulence. There's a function of the ion plasma beta, and this is a measure of the, the width of the inertial range of all of these different kind of mechanisms, Landau resonant mechanisms like Landau damping, transit time damping, uh, kinetic viscous heating that's associated with anisotropy instabilities, magnetic reconnections, stochastic heating, cyclotron damping. And you can take any plasma that you like and plot its region of where it lives in this parameter space and say, okay, so the solar wind, while well, I might expect at low beta some stochastic heating, otherwise it's probably all going to be mostly Lando or transit time damping. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, no questions. <laughs> All right, hello everyone. I am Shivan Kohler. I'm a graduate student at CETA, which is at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm here to talk about my poster, which is going to be up on archive soon. Um, not the poster, the paper. Um, so we perform controlled numerical experiments um, of a realistic galaxy um, to isolate. So we, what we do is we create two branches in the evolution of this galaxy. Uh, one where we keep feedback on or stellar feedback on, one where we turn it off. Um, and we do this to isolate the effects of um, stellar feedback on um, the, uh, the dynamics of the galaxy. Um, and we also then identify um, and track GMCs um, in order to learn more about their star formation properties and to isolate, again, to study the effects of stellar feedback on um, the lives of the GMCs. Uh, what we find is that stellar feedback is uh, the dominant driver of um, turbulence at the 0.5 kiloparsec scales, um, at least within about 10 kiloparsecs of the galactic center. Uh, we also find that stellar feed or star formation efficiencies of GMCs are very sensitive to the uh, presence of stellar feedback. We compare our results or our um, star formation efficiencies um, in the GMCs in our simulation with some predictions from turbulence regulated models. Um, and we find that they cannot capture the effects of stellar feedback through turbulence. Um, so that means one of three things, either the theories are wrong or the simulations are wrong or they're both wrong. Um, I think, obviously, that the simulations have to be correct. Um, so we sort of argue in our paper that um, the turbulence regulated theories need to be revised and um, need to be made more feedback aware. Um, so please do check out my poster. Um, that's it, thank you. Alina? Uh, hello. 
Thank you. Hello, my name is Alina Kachaki. Uh, I'm visiting from, from Michigan State University. I'm a member of the Ice Cube Collaboration, and I also collaborate with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Okay. Uh, I'm really interested in neutrino production and particle acceleration uh, in the inner parsec around AGN cores and the environments there. Uh, so Ice Cube is a sensor or an experiment at the South Pole. It's about 5,000 light sensors embedded into a kilometer of ice uh, there. Okay. It observes a, a spectrum of high energy neutrinos from about 1 TeV to 10 PeV. Uh, okay, so an isotropic flux across the sky, which we can associate and understand that there are astrophysical neutrino sources, uh, yet the dominant source classes are unknown. Okay. We expect neutrino production uh, to occur generally uh, in the collisions of protons and gamma rays. Okay, so when we have very high energy uh, and dense fields of protons and photons, uh, we can produce uh, this delta resonance uh, and pions, which then decay to neutrinos. So tracking this particle acceleration and understanding uh, when and where this happens in time uh, is important for creating sensitive neutrino searches. Okay. So again, we've collaborated with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Uh, and we're using uh, 150, 90, and 220 gigahertz light curves from 200 or so of their Blazar sources uh, to associate with neutrino production. We've used these light curves uh, and developed an analysis to correlate with Ice Cube uh, to search for neutrino production uh, in time correlated with this emission. Uh, and we've also explored uh, one likely source, uh, TXS0506, to understand how uh, this multi-messenger data uh, could correlate with neutrino production uh, and gamma ray data as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Valentin? Uh, hello, I'm Valentin Skutnev. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University. Um, I mostly think about fluid dynamics and dynamo of the interiors of stars, um, and recently of proto-neutron stars. Um, these are things that are smaller than the pixels in most of the simulations we've seen, but um, they do have structure inside of them. Um, and so the, my poster right now is about um, uh, uh, kind of naturally extension of uh, Philip Moses' talk. I basically worked out the um, stability criterion for the Taylor instability in a proto-neutron star. So this takes into account the um, effects of the, uh, um, uh, the neutrinos. So you have very high, high viscosity, very low resistivity, unlike in stars where typically the magnetic ground number is low. So um, uh, come check out my talk. The, basically, this plot is um, giving you a sense of um, when the dynamo, the Taylor spout dynamo, if it exists, um, when it should turn on and at what toroidal field strength you should expect. So on the y-axis, you have the radial field that you might start with right after merger or right after a core collapse supernova. And then if you're given a certain rotation rate on the x-axis, you basically keep winding the toroidal field. The toroidal field is growing linearly in time. At some point, you trigger the Taylor instability. Taylor instability actually has a pretty slow growth rate, so you have to wait until the Taylor instability saturates. And that basically, when the Taylor instability growth rate becomes comparable to one over the lifetime, that's when you expect your dynamo to turn on. So that's kind of giving you the, the rough, rough um, time scales and many field strengths that you would have um, uh, that, that basically, uh, um, that you would have at the onset of the Taylor sprout dynamo inside a um, proto-neutron star. Thank you very much. Okay, so hello, my name is Valerio Rivares. I'm an assigned PB postdoc. I mean, my research, my research focused on the filaments uh, that are located at the center of galaxy cluster. Um, so my poster mostly is about the relationship between the H-alpha and the X-ray luminosities of the filaments that we already hear a lot about that uh, during this morning. Um, so in the second part of my poster, I focus on the relation uh, between the, the metallicity relation between the warm and the hot gas of the uh, filaments and measuring the hot Gas metallicity is fairly easy. The complicated part of this work came, uh, is about measuring the metallicity in, of the warm gas. And the reason for that is because most of the um, calibrations are done for star formation regions. And if we put the um, 
the warm gas in this famous uh, PPT diagram, we see that they're, they're located in the composite regions, meaning that the, the H alpha is powered by, uh, uh, by mixing of something else plus uh, a star formation. But we found a very cool approach. We use this deep projected PPT diagram um, and also spectral decomposition method, and we found that the filaments are being powered by uh, the star formation uh, in the region that you see here, the, the red in the red part. Um, so we use those regions to measure the metallicity of the of the warm gas. But there are some other um, <coughs> sources where the star formation is very very low. So as you see here, they are being dominated by liner light emissions. So we use some other calibration. So as you see here in this work, there is a lot of systematics. But if we put those things together, the, uh, the metallicity of the warm gas, um, the metallicity of the intercluster medium, we see these very beautiful correlations. So. If you want to know more, please come to see me at my poster. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I need to do some something over here because I received a late talk. One second. Uh, Stefano, please come on over. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Stefano Sotira from the University of Bologna. I'm a second year PhD student and I'm working with uh, Franco Vaz and Fabrizio Briganti. Uh, practice I've been running um, a hydrodynamic simulation of the feedback from the AGN in Galaxy Cluster. The simulations are performed with uh, the ENSO code. And uh, in practice I'm focusing about different types of feedback. Uh, so starting from pure uh, kinetic feedback to up to almost uh, pu pure thermal feedback. And uh, well, I'm focusing on the velocity dispersion at the center of the cluster. So uh, I found that there are some cases in which the velocity dispersion is comparable to the one observed in the Perseus cluster. And uh, of course, it depends from the feedback injection and from the activity of the AGN and also from the, on the direction of the line of sight. Uh, I also studied the velocity structure function. And uh, well, this um, kind of turbulence show that there is no uh, trivial, um, a trivial correlation between the 3D, the three dimensional velocity structure function at the projected one. So it's not so easy from the observation to, to find the, the real uh, um, velocity structure function. And that's it, thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, we have one last uh, talk. Uh, please come on over here. It might be a bit hard to read, so maybe uh, introduce yourself, read the, the title. Don't worry about it. I'll uh, speak as the slowest, and uh, uh, this is a teaser. So uh, this is a, um, I got a grant from UK on this, and this talks about how you can calculate possible dark energy. And with the poster, we use the uh, Earth as a uh, guide, as a bench post. So we start with this mathematics that was peer reviewed. I think it's very solid. There's a lot of people looked at it. And so dark energy creates turbulence and it creates spin. And so anybody who wants to know more about it, I'll be more than happy to flap my jaws at the poster presentation. Uh, but this is the math. Perfect, thank you so much uh, to all of our lightning talk speakers. Now we can go ahead and enjoy the posters, and then at 5.30 we will have the reception followed by the dinner at 6, so don't go away. Thank you. <laughs>